My name is uh, Carol Champion. I'm the Director of Industrial Engagement at the Ontario Centres of Excellence. I'd like to thank you for joining us and uh, welcoming you to, uh, to Discovery. Uh, before we go any further, I'd like to acknowledge the generous support of Gowlings, the sponsors for this presentation theater. So I'm delighted to welcome you to this uh, panel discussion, Innovation Transportation for a Sustainable Future. The development of sustainable transportation faces many challenges, starting where the fuel originates and how it's processed to delivering safe, efficient and accessible transit the problem of how to move people efficiently requires creative solutions. So in this panel, our participants will consider designs for innovative transportation systems that provide efficient and environmentally friendly local and long distance people movement. To guide us through this discussion, our moderator today is David Pascoe, Vice President of Engineering the Americas for Magna International. David manages Magna's international corporate act, uh, engineering activities at Magna's global headquarters in uh, Aurora, Ontario. He also participates in Magna's e-car systems, electric and hybrid vehicle development and integration programs, particularly in the area of energy storage. Welcome David and uh, thank you very much for joining us this morning. That. Are we going to put my material up? Are we going to put my material up? Okay, that's quite all right. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you, Carol. And I'm delighted to be here to have the opportunity to lead a discussion on what I consider to be a very important topic innovative transportation for a sustainable future. Uh, the session will include an overview, uh, panelist presentation, so each of our panelists will have five to seven minutes to talk about their take on uh, this topic. We'll have 10 minutes of Q&A, uh, where I'll, I'll ask discuss, uh, questions, and we'll have 10 minutes of questions by the audience. So you'll have an opportunity to ask our panelists questions. It's okay. Um, and then we'll have closing remarks. So the words sustainable transportation brings a lot of images to our mind. An important question is how do you define sustainable transportation? And you can look at energy and CO2 usage and so forth. So how much energy does a particular type of transportation use on a per person kilometer basis? How much CO2 is produced? And how do you manage all of that? And short and long distance transportation often have very different uh, technologies that can be applied. For example, going across the street, you're not going to take an aircraft. And going across the ocean, you're not going to walk. So certain for forms of transportation have different types of options. And also different types of fuel. So because of the fuel's uh, mass, its uh, volume, and vehicle emission restrictions, we're limited on what our selection of fuels are. And so that's one of the challenges of uh, trying to find the right fuels for transportation. For example, coal is plentiful, but it's maybe not a good way to run your car because of managing emissions. So our main form of transportation fuel is oil, and it's fantastic because of its energy density, its ability to be economically transported, uh, but the challenge is the rising oil prices and the future security and availability of this fuel, and that's some of the drivers why we need to look at uh, different alternative energy sources. On another note, uh, we have city infrastructure and public transit and what's the best way to implement that? How do you manage uh, street lanes between bicycles, cars and public transit? And also which public transit methods uh, can we afford and how should we pay for these uh, through the public sector and the private sector? And finally, we have to consider alternative fuels which ones can be plentiful, economical, and portable. So these are some of the topics you might want to think about while, you're, uh, while we're, our presenters are presenting, and you might want to bring questions to them uh, toward the end. 
So I just want to introduce our panelists now. The first one is uh, Richard Wallace. Richard's the Director for Transportation System Analysis for the Center for Automotive Research, or CAR. Richard has 19 years of experience designing, conducting, and managing transportation projects and research. He serves as project manager for CAR's connected vehicle efforts for the Michigan Department of Transportation. CAR's work on the U.S. Department of Transportation RETA project to apply remote sensing to bridge health monitoring and CAR's components of mobile computing project for the U.S. Army's National Automotive Center. Welcome, Richard. Uh, next to Richard is Jonathan Hack. He's manager for Strategic Technology Engineering University and Government Relations for Bombardier Aerospace. So Bombardier is currently the th world's third largest civil aircraft manufacturer. And Jonathan joined Bombardier Aer Aerospace in 2010 after an extensive career in automotive with General Motors, both in Canada and internationally. His role at Bombardier, in his role at Bombardier, Jonathan is responsible for providing vision and leadership to the strategic technology portfolio of research projects that are administered through Bombardier Aerospace's Toronto site. And thank you very much for joining us, Jonathan. Our next panelist is Glenn Miller. He is the Vice President of Education and Research for the Canadian Urban Institute, or CUI. Glenn is responsible for the Institute's Canadian programming and is a fellow of the Canadian Institute of Planners. The CUI's work has received awards for excellence from CIP, the Ontario Professional, Professional Planners Institute, or OPPI, and the Ontario Federal Council. Glenn also teaches in the graduate planning program at Ryerson University's School of Urban and Regional Planning and recently concluded his tenure as editor of the Ontario Planning Journal the professional practice magazine of OPPI that he founded in 1986. Welcome to the panel, Glenn. And completing our panel is Curtis McBride. He's the young CEO and co-founder of Myovision Technologies. Recently named to the top 40 under 40 list, Curtis and two partners incorporated Myovision in 2005 to commercialize research conducted during his master's studies in computer vision. Since then, Myovision has grown to a staff of 50 and are making final arrangements for their second office upgrade in plans of supporting their growing team. A leader in the computer field, Curtis is driven, the driven entrepreneur responsible for Myovision's technology sales and technological vision. And thank you, Curtis, and thank you to all of the panelists for being with us today. To, to start, each of our panelists has prepared a brief presentation, and I'd like to invite Richard Wallace to begin, and then following that, Jonathan Hack, Glenn Miller, and Curtis McBride in that order. Okay, Richard. Thank you, David. So I was asked to talk to you about two areas of surface transportation, one having to do with uh, vehicle communications for connectivity and how we might someday have cars that actually cannot crash into each other. And then kind of as an add-on, no one was going to talk about freight, so I had some thoughts about some future of freight transportation for the Great Lakes region, which I'll uh, sneak in there, I hope. Uh, next slide, please. So I want to think about a couple questions. This is supposed to be future transportation. What if vehicles were connected to one each, each other in the roadside? What if they could not crash into each other? or into bicycles, pedestrians, and other things. What could this revolutionize how we could actually design a vehicle? It wouldn't have to be so heavy. Some other things would come into play. Battery packs for electric vehicles could be a lot smaller, things like that. And then finally, what if we could transform the Detroit-Windsor region, this is the freight part, into a global freight gateway? What would that do for the diversification and strength of the economy? Next. So if you're not familiar with uh, connected vehicles, some of you probably are, some of you aren't. This is using radio communications to electronically bind vehicles together. If I know where they all are, I can't bump into them. It's like air traffic control. We manage the whole system through a combination of uh, technologies, one of which is wireless communication. There's safety benefits, mobility benefits, real-time traffic management, guidance, things like that. Environmental benefits, if I never have to stop and I move smoothly, better fuel economy, lower emissions. Next. 
it's happening at the same time as electrification is happening. And there's a couple of nice synergies of that. Not only do they not bump into each other, but you can do things to improve the fuel economy and environmental performance. Next. And one more. Oh, back one. I must have had an animation in here I didn't know about. Uh, so different dimensions of synergy between these things. One is there's that battery electric vehicle anxiety. How far can I go before I run out of gas? What if we had real-time mapping, location of every possible place you could go in and charge? You're not going to run out of juice before you get home. That could help alleviate some of those concerns. There's issues with integration with smart grid on how we you know, recharge when prices are the lowest. So you want to plug in, but you don't want it to charge. We heard a little bit about that here yesterday in this very room. Plug it in, but let the grid find out when it's cheapest then charge and it's ready to go when you get up in the morning. And at the last level, what if there were full situational awareness of the whole roadside environment? What's coming up topography? What's coming up with congestion, traffic? We manage that powertrain to suck every last optimization out of it to get the maximum, I won't say fuel economy, but electric economy. It could be through regenerative braking, through taking advantages of downhills, uphills, and however we want to maximize performance. Route you most efficiently. We're going to have the least stops and things like that. Next. Uh, and so I've talked about this already. This is the energy plan. This is an old slide set. So we're going to leaf through a few here. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. And keep going. And there's the situational awareness slide that I wanted to jump to. And one more. So there's an example of what, and we can run the video now. This is a GM concept that uh, a, a colleague of mine at, at General Motors is helping to develop, uh, Chris Baroni Bird. Some of you may know him. If you had all those advantages I just talked about, full knowledge, you could see everywhere through radio and radar and, and other things, you wouldn't need several thousand pounds of a vehicle. You wouldn't need uh, gas stations necessarily. You wouldn't need lots of things that are there for safety and the like. And you could do all sorts of interesting and innovative things. And this is a video they put together. I think the city you see around here is Shanghai because of the uh, expo that was there last uh, fall. So now you've got an electric vehicle that's networked, the electric network vehicle, or NV. And it's very small and lightweight. It operates itself effectively, autonomously, through a combination of sensors and communications. I'll let you watch for a little bit. So it uses range sensing to not bump into things. It's got vision systems built into it. It's got GPS, obviously. So we can use positional accuracy to suck performance out of it. Uh, key features here I want to show off before we cut this and move on to just a minute or two about freight. So you can platoon vehicles, tight together, fast space, short spacings that is, move more people. We want to move people, we don't want to move vehicles through uh, a, a less roadway, if you will. S setting priorities for emergency vehicles and alerting all the other vehicles to get out of the way. Don't need traffic lights anymore. Vehicles have a time space path through intersections, energy savings and such. And you can't crash, most importantly of all. Why don't we move on? The, the video was cool. Freight gateway, radical change. Hopefully nobody got whiplash here. We're off of futuristic vehicles. There's a notion out there. Next, please. Hit it a couple of times. I want to see the arrows come in here. If we could link the Windsor-Detroit region to important ports at Halifax, in Montreal, we can majorly diversify the Great Lakes economy by turning it into sort of Chicago East. Chicago is the major freight hub of the, of the Midwest of North America. 
but it's highly congested there. There are opportunities to do a lot of that intermodal freight work in other parts of the world, namely the Windsor, Detroit region, and, and the economies of those two cities and the surrounding area, Toledo even, could benefit from that. Halifax, next slide, links to the world in um, very interesting ways. It's time of, uh, of reaching major ports in, in Europe, the Mediterranean, the Middle East, is faster than the New York, New Jersey alternatives. And you know, time is money in the shipping business. Lowest landed cost is what every major shipper wants to get. Halifax offers that opportunity. Next. There are lots of organizations working together to put in the infrastructure needed. A new bridge that certain people in Ontario and Ottawa are helping us to build plays a part here, but it's not it. So the Ambassador Bridge is still important. We need some more freight terminals. Uh, CP and CN are heavily engaged on these topics. And uh, for only $5 billion, which is really not that much if you think of it, we believe we can get Detroit, Windsor, to be a strong competitor to Chicago for freight handling. Quick story, GM will often ship freight to Chicago only to ship it back to Michigan. So they assemble it there. That just makes no sense for, our, for the Detroit-Windsor region. One more slide, I think, and we'll wrap up here. Same questions I had at the beginning. Hopefully, it's giving you some thoughts. What would a radicalized, revolutionary vehicle of the future that doesn't have to be heavy to protect your life, doesn't have to be gas powered, can be electronically linked with other vehicles, how would that just majorly change the, the uh, nature of vehicle transportation? And how can we transform the Great Lakes economy into more of a freight gateway or thoughts I'll leave you with? Good morning. Um, innovative transportation for a sustainable future. That is uh, two buzzwords in it that uh, really interest me, both innovation and sustainability. Uh, next slide. Uh, Bombardier's participation in this uh, space um, isn't on the automotive side. We're talking rail and, uh, and aerospace. We have two divisions about equal size and both are global uh, companies in their own right with uh, products that are manufactured and sold around the world. Next slide. In terms of our rail division, we're a global leader. Uh, we have the broadest po product portfolio and a worldwide installed base of over 100,000 vehicles. So that's substantial and that's headquartered in Berlin, uh, Germany. Next slide. I think what's important for innovation and sustainability is to participate on all elements of the value chain. And so we not only provide uh, rolling uh, stock, so commuter chains, uh, regional trains, high-speed trains, but we're also involved in services and solutions for the uh, rail transport market. And so we offer... Um, fleet management, operations and maintenance, uh, vehicle refurbishment as well, uh, as well as uh, control systems that can be used in rail travel as well. Next slide. One of our new products is the Eco4 uh, line of products. It's modular, but importantly for Bombardier, it exhibits what we call the four E's. Uh, it saves energy, increases efficiency, uh, has great economic value, and is environmental, environmentally responsible. Next slide. In order to do this, you need to leverage advanced technology. So you need to leverage new materials and technology, advanced control systems, and even on uh, rail travel, improved aerodynamics. You put this all together into an integrated solution, and you've got a solution that has up to 50% uh, fuel savings over uh, competitive fleets that it, uh, it would replace. Uh, next slide. So I've covered our rail division, and how we're also involved in sustainable transportation is on the aerospace side. I'm a part of the um, uh, aerospace group, and we have a manufacturing facility in Toronto, which was the former de Havilland facility, where we manufacture global business jets and the Q400 turboprop. Uh, next slide. In terms of the entire portfolio, uh, you can see the turboprop there. The regional jets are manufactured in Quebec. And then we have the single aisle mainline jets, and this is the C-Series that is coming into service in uh, 2013. Next slide. 
As far as business aircraft goes, we own Learjet. They're in uh, Kansas. And uh, we have the Challenger family of jets that's manufactured in Montreal and the Global family in Toronto. Now, uh, next slide. How are we involved in sustainable transportation solutions? I think a good example of that is our C-Series jet. So it uh, offers 20% fewer uh, CO2 emissions, 50% less NOx, and four times quieter than uh, aircraft that it is uh, going to replace when it enters into service. Um, next slide. And then our last example is what's made here uh, right in Toronto, and that is our Q400 um, turboprop. In terms of its environmental impact, it uses 30 to 40 percent less fuel than older regional jet aircraft that it replaces of a similar size, 30 to 40 percent fewer emissions, and is one of the quietest aircraft in the world. So we're very uh, proud of this. And then in terms of sustainability on the fuel side, we're going to talk to that further. We're looking at uh, biofuels to go into this plane. So we're partnered with Sustainable Growth Canada, uh, Porter Airlines and Pratt & Whitney around an uh, entire value chain solution that is going to uh, grow the, uh, the uh, uh, crop, harvest it, refine it, and, uh, and put it in our aircraft um, for, um, for use in the next, uh, within the next five years. So that's it. Thank you so much. Well, good morning and thank you. Uh, uh, it's uh, very uh, good to be here. Um, I have a little video that isn't going to work, so I'm going to have to use my hands a lot. I'm told that I can use the shadow screen here. Um, I'm going to talk to you about a, a very different scale, about uh, moving people in, in, at, the, at the city region uh, scale. Um, th what we see on the, on the left-hand side uh, is, is something that a lot of us are familiar with, which is uh, congested roads. Um, and on the, uh, uh, on the right-hand side, you see something that we tend to neglect, although we did hear about uh, the need to, to move freight. And so when we're talking about transit and, and transportation in cities, we really uh, often focus just on, on the moving the people part. And the picture in the middle depicts the fact that you've got to have critical mass in, uh, of people in order to be able to move people effectively. Thank you. Next slide. So this is just a small commercial for the, the work that we do at the Institute, the four areas of, of focus. And, and one of the, the things that perhaps we can get into in the question period is we're doing some research into uh, mobility uh, for an aging population. But that's uh, uh, something that maybe we'll leave for the question period. Next slide, please. So um, I have uh, come up with uh, five uh, uh, criteria that I think we have to um, uh, put in front of us to be able to determine whether we're going to have uh, sustainable transportation systems. For public transit, uh, transit uh, public transit has to be an irresistible alternative to the car, and we're talking more than just convenience. Um, we have to think about how we move people in the suburbs. If, how many people are from the, the 905 area of, of Toronto? Quite a few of you, you've probably uh, not taken a lot of transit trips uh, in, in that part of, of the world. And so I think one of the things that we have to do is as we build transportation systems is uh, to figure out how we're going to integrate them into, into our cities. Our cities, uh, transportation systems have to be affordable and viable. Uh, we, we spend a lot of time uh, on the front end of transportation planning and as we found here in the Toronto region, uh, the, uh, the um, overcoming the barrier of affordability when it comes to implementing the transit plan, sometimes that's where we, we fall at that particular hurdle. So it has to be affordable for both the user and the entity providing the services. It also has to be adaptable. Um, you have to be able to grow with the city.
city uh, as, uh, as, as the city uh, grows. Um, and, and as the decades uh, uh, march on, uh, we're going to have increasing fiscal uh, pressures on uh, municipal governments in particular, and the way that we design our transportation systems is going to have to take that into account. We're going to have to rely on more intelligent transportation systems, the kind of her that we heard about uh, earlier. And because we're, we're uh, heading to uh, uh, an aging uh, population where a good uh, one in four of us are going to be there over the age of 65 within a couple of decades, uh, we're going to have to have uh, more of an emphasis on truly accessible uh, transit to, to, be able, to be able to take advantage uh, of all of that. And uh, to say energy efficient, uh, th that goes without saying now, um, but it has to be, uh, transportation systems have to be efficient in, in many ways. So next slide, please. So um, how did we get into this mess? Well, I think one of the problems is that we focused on uh, transportation uh, for c commuting, how we get people to work. We've done that for more than 60 years. Next slide. And so we built car-dependent suburbs. Next slide. And we moved jobs and retail away from places where they could be easily uh, served by public transit. Next slide, please. And we ended up with this. I hope you can see uh, some of this. Uh, this is some work that we recently completed for uh, a consortium of the major office building owners in the uh, Greater Toronto Area. And what this shows is actually a disconnect uh, between the plans that we have for transit and where um, office buildings are located. If you were able to see the detail, all of these little dots represent office buildings of over 30,000 square feet. And as you can see, uh, the the proposed transit lines do not connect with the um, uh, with where the offices are and so many of the uh, office areas beyond uh, the, metro, the beyond the the urbanized area of Toronto have a modal share of uh, four percent five percent of people taking transit and that is leading to huge congestion and that's that's where it undercuts all of our efforts on on sustainability uh, next slide please so this was to have been a video. Um, I'm, this is where I'm going to use my hands here. This is actually, um, I was going to tell you about uh, an opportunity to think out of the box uh, and uh, to uh, introduce uh, something uh, like aerial transit. Uh, aerial transit, detachable gondolas, similar to the kind you find uh, at, uh, at your uh, local ski resort, uh, actually has a lot of uh, benefits that uh, uh, meet the test of affordable and viable. Uh, we have uh, six opportunities uh, or six examples around the world where they've been fully integrated into the transit system uh, at a fraction of the cost uh, and, and in terms of disruption uh, into, into the urban fabric. They're also adaptable. They can grow with the, uh, with the, uh, with the city. Um, in uh, Medellin, which is where this video would have shown you, um, uh, they have some vertical challenges to overcome, um, but it also works in, in, in very well in a, in a linear way, and it's the kind of service that can provide the equivalent of a well-run streetcar in, in mixed traffic at a fraction of the cost. And it's accessible, you can get wheelchair uh, access into these, and it's a very, very reliable and ideal for opportunities where you're trying to grow transit. So uh, next slide, please. That'll be really the final slide. And just to show you that I'm not uh, uh, dreaming here, uh, this is a project that is very close to uh, implementation. Uh, colleagues out on the West Coast in uh, Burnaby, BC, um, what you see here uh, on the top left is the peak-to-peak uh, uh, -peak gondola using the same technology. Uh, the idea is to uh, link the SkyTrain to the top of Burnaby Mountain where they're building a sustainable uh, community, university it's called, uh, with, uh, adjacent to Simon Fraser University. And uh, it's going to cut the travel time from 17 minutes to 6 minutes. And it's going to pay for itself in less than 
12 years, they actually went back and did the calculations again because they couldn't believe it. It's such a good return on investment. And the greenhouse gas uh, reduction opportunities are, are phenomenal. Um, and for me, one of the most interesting things is if anybody's ever gone out to catch a streetcar and seen it disappearing down the street and, uh, and wondering when the next one is going to come along, it doesn't really encourage you to take uh, public transit. The great thing about gondolas is that you, there's always another one. You can see it coming. And so it helps encourage the transit habit in places where there isn't a high volume and there isn't the culture for taking public transit. And I think I'm going to close it there. Thank you very much. Good morning. You can uh, go to the next slide. I'm just going to start out with a uh, just a quick video that kind of gives you some context for what uh, my vision is all about. So we basically provide uh, an automated way to do intersection counts. You've probably seen guys sitting by the side of the road sort of manually counting cars. Uh, we basically provide sort of a more automated, more accurate way uh, to do that count. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about, uh, I guess, why that's important and where the industry is going generally. Um, once we get through the hardware piece, basically it's a telescoping mast that sits at an intersection, collects video, and we turn it into traffic data. You can, uh, you can skip the rest of the video. This is more of a MyVision commercial. So I want to talk about uh, red lights. Um, we've all living you know, in, in southern Ontario, we've all experienced sitting, waiting at a red light. Um, you know, we get to where we're trying to get to slowly, we burn uh, fuel, uh, it's frustrating. Um, so someone should really be working on trying to eliminate red lights. Next slide. So the reason why we often sit waiting at red lights is, uh, and, and people don't really think about this very often, but uh, the way that we time lights is once every three to five years, a city will basically commission an engineering firm to uh, go out, do a bunch of traffic counts, typically for you know, three hours in the morning, three hours in the afternoon. We make the assumption that those traffic counts are going to be representative for the next three to five years. We do a bunch of engineering work that tells us uh, how to time light, so how much you know, time to give east-west versus north-south uh, different times of day. And then sometimes there's central systems where we can deploy those lights, but more often than not, a tech has to actually drive out to each intersection and deploy the new signal timings. Uh, if I take uh, where I'm from, region of Waterloo as an example, uh, we do it every three years. We do one third of our intersections every, every year. And so the interesting thing is that what happens is that when I, next year, when I retime one third of my intersections, I actually mess up the timings from the year before that I set that were optimal. Um, Next slide. So what happens here is that the process is expensive, uh, a lot of you know, manual engineering time that goes into it. Um, we burn a lot of fuel, uh, so there's an environmental impact every time we have to sit at a red light or accelerate our cars, and we don't get to where we're trying to get to fast, fast enough. Um, so now I want you to imagine a world, next slide, um, I want you to imagine a world now where everywhere you go is green lights. Uh, next slide. So where the industry is moving is basically instead of having this kind of periodic, uh, ma very manual based uh, sort of calibration of our networks is to real time calibration of our network, something called adaptive signal control uh, or smart grids. Uh, but basically imagine uh, a world where the intersections actually knew not only about the cars that were at their particular intersection, but were network aware. So they knew about the cars that were actually coming to the intersections, um, knew about where transit vehicles were, knew where pedestrians were, and all of that information is basically being used to calibrate the timing of lights better, um, you know, with ultimately the goal of sort of eliminating the red light experience. Next slide. Net benefit, um, you get away from this kind of, you know, always this rat race of always having to recalibrate your signals, so it's a much more cost effective solution. Um, the, the drivers ultimately get to where they're going faster, so you can argue that there's a sort of an or an economic benefit in, in productivity gain. You know, if I spend 15 minutes less in my car every day, um, and then there's a true tax uh, or true savings to the taxpayer in the fuel cost. So we're doing a, a pilot project right now 
uh, in, for a similar system to this out, uh, out west, and we estimate that the the gas savings alone to the taxpayer will be two times uh, the cost of operating the system on an annual basis. So there's a significant benefit, you know, financially just to, to the taxpayer. Um, so sort of conclusion, I guess, is uh, you know, the way we're doing things right now, uh, it's not working. Uh, we continue to urbanize. Um, you know, we're going to have longer and longer times to be waiting at red lights. Um, but there are, there are moves afoot in the industry to kind of get, get us away from this old tech way of managing our traffic networks uh, toward a little bit more of a, a smart uh, grid. Next slide. How'd that get in there? Um, in all seriousness, uh, one of the major challenges that companies like MyVision has is that traffic's not, it's not sexy. Uh, no one grows up wanting to you know, be a traffic software developer. Um, but the flip side is that traffic impacts us all every day. We all drive, uh, you know, the food we buy, it, it, there's fuel costs built into that. Um, and the challenge for guys like me and people on this panel is to, to bring awareness to this industry and to you know, inspire young engineers in the room who might want a job at MyVision to uh, come and apply and you know, help us uh, move us, no pun intended, move us into the future. So thank you. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to have to take a microphone here. So. Yeah. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for your very interesting presentations. Thanks to our panelists. And now we're going to spend a few minutes. I'm going to uh, do some Q&A with our panelists, and then you, the audience, will get an opportunity to do the same and bring your challenging questions to them. So the first question I have is, uh, what do you see as emerging technology trends in sustainable transportation over the next 10 years? So I'm hoping for one of you to raise your hand. Does Jonathan, do you want to take that one? Sure, I think, um, as I mentioned in my presentation, I think uh, a holistic approach um, to um, a transportation solution, so not only providing the, the product, but also providing the service and looking at the entire network and, uh, and being involved in all elements of the value chain helps you understand where uh, opportunities for improvement are. And I think uh, by taking that holistic approach, that, that's the greatest opportunity for improvement. Yeah, very good. Glenn. I, I'd come back to the point I made about uh, uh, public transit being, uh, needs to be irresistible to the user. One of the things that's really going to help that is uh, intelligent systems that uh, allow people to know when the next bus is coming uh, or uh, allow a bus to be able to go through lights. We already have this technology, but to have it more integrated in, into the regular system so the system works better and uh, more effectively for people. Okay, very good. I would just add that, you know, one thing I said in my talk is, is key. The, the goal is to move people when they need to move, not to move vehicles. So the more we can use urban form and urban design, as Glenn was talking about, to put those things closer together that need to be together, keeping in mind the aging issue that he mentioned, which is true in the States, perhaps even more than it is here in Canada. I don't, I'm not sure which is, which is worse, but when those uh, aging folks age out in these... Uh, shady suburbs, they have no mobility whatsoever. So there's going to be some sort of change in, in, in living patterns as, as we move in the for future. Okay, good. Just quickly, what, one trend I see as the uh, price of energy goes up and the emphasis on uh, green you know, continues to, to build, I think whether it's through regulation, uh, economic forces, or even social forces, uh, the move towards you know, s systems that uh, you know, promote saving money, improving the environment is going to start to build, build and build uh, more and more. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's going to drive it. Uh, where you can improve the environment, improve time to work, and save money all at once are the premium solutions. So those, are, those will be the winners for sure. Okay, uh, next question. How do we address the congestion and pollution problems within our current infrastructure? I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm going to try to answer this not self-servingly, but... Um, <laughs> I mean, I think, uh, you know, 
obviously, I mean, obviously, move towards smarter grids is going to be one way to go. But I think part of it too is that you know we've already made huge investments into uh, into infrastructure, you know, traffic control at every intersection, for example. So whatever solutions we come up with, if they're going to be adopted quickly, uh, need to be done in a way that minimizes the uh, the investments that cities need to make in order to kind of move move themselves forward. We don't want to rip out. All of our existing infrastructure, in order to you know make our our networks better, uh, you know we need to come up with solutions that kind of minimize that upfront investment, but give us no. give us the the benefit. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, it's uh, you know we if we had all the money, we could change the whole world, but we've got to start with what we have. I think that's a really great point, Curtis. Yeah, Glenn. I'd yeah. just add that uh, we have to take advantage of investments that we've already made. We've got uh, a, a lot of transportation infrastructure in place and we've got a lot of built infrastructure and, and uh, to, to the point that was made over here uh, we when we have uh, clusters of office buildings where uh, people cannot uh, be uh, served by transit uh, we have to uh, look at ways that we can um, improve the pedestrian environment improve the um, the density of the uh, and, and range of uses in those areas so that it becomes attractive for public transit to, to, to be used and you mm -hmm. get then a better value because those buildings aren't moving. Right, right. Yeah, very good. I would just point out, I agree, we have to have an incremental approach because we won't get to those 20-year solutions overnight. There's things that have to be built, developed, deployed. But if you look at a couple opportunities, we have vehicle occupancy for commuting trips in the states is like 1.08. <laughs> if we simply got one-tenth more folks into the same vehicle, we free up lots of slots in the traffic stream. And if we can do adaptive signal control for corridor movement and some of the platooning issues I was talking about, we, we've already started to get solutions. But also uh, other things out here that uh, you can see around this exhibit hall, some of the IT technology, if you can telecommute once a day, if a high percentage of people could do that, look at the reduction in, in trip needs during commuting hours. They can go out at lunch, but they don't have to go out at 8 a.m. potentially. Yeah, and that's a good point as well with telecommuting. You have the uh, virtual meetings and so on that are you know, not necessarily a transportation means, but a way to make the whole system more sustainable. Yeah, and uh, cut down on wear and tear and time and so on. So that's a good point. Okay, uh, Canada doesn't have many large cities. So should we focus on finding solutions for big cities because that's where maintaining economic competitive is most crucial? So who wants to take that on? Glenn? Well, I, I, I'll have a go at that one. Uh, the, um, the, I mean, we have three or four large uh, city regions and we can imagine um, investing in the kind of uh, innovative technology that we heard about this morning in, in those cities. But what's going to happen in the small and medium cities? We have to uh, think about uh, the needs of, of transportation there. And uh, so perhaps we will be moving away from uh, sort of large system thinking and uh, have more automate or more automated, uh, easy to access systems. And we we heard on the news yesterday that McDonald's is doing away with uh, people at the front counter um, in, in in Europe in the in the coming years. Maybe we're going to have more automated uh, transit systems, uh, dial a ride, uh, the, and things like that. They're going to be able to serve some of the lower density, smaller uh, markets. One of the things that uh, Glenn mentioned was the uh, the phrase uh, uh, city regions, I think, and I, th I think that's an important uh, distinction. So we need to look not only at Toronto, but we need to look at the entire GTA and the linkages between the, uh, the 416 and the 905 uh, to look at uh, efficiencies across the system. So I think that's key. Okay. This is my last question, and then we'll go over to the audience. Uh, what can the transportation sector do to enhance the economic competitiveness of Ontario and perhaps in particular the Great Lakes region? Richard, do you want to? <laughs> I'm never going to write hard questions again for this panel. But uh, a, a couple things. One is we obviously have a lot of transportation capacity in, in this region. The auto companies of North America are headquartered in this area. And 
we're beginning to see an economic recovery in that industry, and that's important. Other uh, technologies for train and, and, and air and, and the like, I think actually one of the linchpins for this region that, that maybe they got short thrift uh, here today is, is rail and freight on rail, and it ties back into my freight gateway comments. The importance of CP and CN, as well as some of the American railroads, and being able to move freight from East Coast ports. One thing I didn't mention is the, the new uh, ocean-going vessels for standard uh, containers are getting larger and larger. They can't even fit through the Panama Canal anymore. That means they also can't fit at most of the East Coast ports. So Halifax and Norfolk basically become the only two that can uh, hold these large post-Panamax uh, ships. So there's opportunities there to get freight into the heartland where it can be reprocessed. And, and this region has the workforce to do that because we did it in auto for so many years, moving parts around. The, the key for me for Ontario is, uh, is innovation. I uh, had the opportunity to, to visit uh, Singapore this year. And although it's not a particularly low cost region, the uh, commitment to innovation, the commitment to continuous improvement there uh, really uh, sustains investment over time and I think as we become uh, really committed to continuous improvement, looking for waste in everything we do and, and not content to sit where we are, but continuously improvement, drive waste out, we'll be better positioned to uh, participate in the opportunities that are coming out in the future. So I'd, I'd add two points. One on the, on the uh, moving people uh, part is uh, I, I, if we can uh, afford it to actually connect places like Waterloo with uh, places in, in Toronto so that you, if you're going to visit people in Waterloo, you don't have to dedicate half a day uh, in, in travel time. And that's very, you know, lost productivity right. uh, is the flip side of, uh, of, of, uh, of innovation. Uh, on the freight side, I'm really glad to hear, you know, discussion about freight. Uh, we did a, a little uh, goods primer um, uh, a number of years ago, which was really the first time that people had started to, to look at um, the issue of goods movement. There's huge potential, huge strides made in uh, GPS and all kinds of intelligent transportation systems if we could find a way to get the data uh, and aggregate it uh, in a way from, uh, from uh, pr uh, private users uh, and aggregate it so that it could be used for planning purposes, we'd be able to fill a great big blank in, in the urban system. I mean, I would just say there's a lot, I mean, I've traveled to different geographies and seeing how they invest in their transportation systems and you take a place like Florida or the UK uh, and it's a priority they spend you know a lot of money making their their networks uh, work better and you can when you drive through them you can you can feel it um, and I think you know obviously my my scopes probably limited to the the urban drive but uh, I think there's lots of things we could do to make more investments in in our infrastructure as well okay Okay, those were some uh, good questions. So uh, at this point, I want to open it up to the audience and uh, we'll be happy to take your questions for the panel or your comments. And so I think there's some microphones available. We've got one in the center aisle here. Are there some handheld ones around, Carol? Or just, just the center one? Okay, just the center one. So. Uh, okay, so why don't we start with you, Shoot. sir? Go All ahead right. and ask your question. Uh, one of the things that, uh, I've just moved back from London, England, and one of the things that uh, troubles me uh, is the car culture. Uh, and when you're talking about innovative transportation systems, uh, there's a big shift in people's perception and people's use and people's attitude towards transportation, which I think needs to come almost alongside or even before some of these innovative systems can actually roll out. You're not going to get uh, a big infrastructure spend on a public transportation network when everybody just likes to roll out the front door, jump into the leather seat vehicle, and, and drive. The convenience is so hard to overcome. So how, how, do you, how do you sort of offset that? Do you put in penalties for using uh, you know, private vehicles? Do you make, how, do, how do you do that? How do you change the, 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 the culture? Uh, it's not something that I've heard you, you talk about. It, it, do you see a big need for social change? Uh, to accompany this uh, innovation? That, that's a really excellent question. I know for 
myself, I live in suburbia, and having a car I consider today to be a necess necessity. But have, has anyone here got some uh, thoughts on that question? I mean, I, I think it's a pretty big scope in terms of the, the solution. I mean, I'll give you one example. We're, uh, the beta project that we're doing at West, um, they basically have their, they want to have their buses always, or at least most of the time, hit green lights. Uh, and the idea is that they can then turn around and use that in their marketing to say, take public transit because, you know, you'll never have to wait at a, at a red light. Um, so things like that to encourage, um, you know, getting that 1.08 uh, people per vehicle number uh, up higher. Um, but I mean, I'm sure you guys probably have a whole range of other examples, but it's a pretty, it's a culture shift, really. I think that's a really excellent question. Um, I think it's significant that the TTC has uh, recently employed a fellow that they hired away from uh, uh, Transport for London uh, to specifically work on customer relations. And we need to put more effort into marketing, uh, which uh, is only going to work if you can follow it through with, with better service. I heard a, a, an announcement on the TDC the other day that there was a, a, tra a disruption at uh, northbound at the Ossington uh, subway station. And if anybody's from Toronto, you know that uh, it, it isn't uh, a north-south uh, uh, station. There was a little bit of a problem. It sort of undermines your uh, um, uh, faith in the, in the system when you hear that. Right. right. And I, I think one of the part of the answer too is as we build those alternate infrastructures, it becomes more convenient to use them. Right. Is, is there any other comments, or do you want to go to the next question? Just a quick one, then with the next question. I'm not sure it's as much as a cultural issue as, as the context and opportunities that are provided. When I'm in Michigan, I have few choices within a large scale than, than to drive for most trips, just because the way the infrastructure is set up. I lived in Chicago for seven years and never once drove a car to work because it would be the stupidest thing to do to drive a car to work. You'd sit there for 30 minutes not moving, pay 20 bucks a day to park, and now the gas is five. Well, I, don't, I shouldn't say. We pay 425. I don't know what you're paying here. But, uh, you know, the incentives are all there. People do make fairly rational choices within the context we provide. And in a lot of our cities or, or areas, we have not provided rational choices for them. Okay. Okay. Uh, last question. Okay. I'll, Ross, be, I'll yeah. be quick. Um, I see a big uh, barrier here is the difference between the private sector and the public sector. And for, for us to have a sustainable transportation system that's effective and efficient, you need to have a good marriage between the two. Private is fast, uh, highly innovative, lots of expertise, um, and have got great ideas on how to improve the situation public sector are slow as moving glaciers, um, do not have expertise, and multi-levels of bureaucracy. Uh, therein lies the problem. Is it possible that the private sector can do more of offering to pick up the public sector's responsibilities, i.e., we'll manage your traffic light system, we'll manage your roads, we'll design a roundabout instead of a traffic light, we'll take over uh, some of these public transpo transportation systems. And what's the barrier for the pub private sector from doing more of that or, or making more offers to the public sector to pick up the tab? Maybe I, I'll start off. Uh, um, it, it, I think the, the big barrier is procurement. Uh, I worked on a, a very interesting project a number of years ago in, in this part of the world where five uh, companies at all elements of the supply chain came together to um, come forward and offer the provincial government a really terrific solution to uh, improving the transit network. And uh, the uh, the reason it didn't go forward was was procurement because there it, it, there just isn't a way uh, to be able to respond to private sector innovation uh, because of concerns about transparency and, and all that kind of thing. Yeah, I, I think it's an excellent suggestion. I think there's there's great opportunity to move forward with uh, public private sector partnerships to begin with, but and I think as the private sector shows uh, expertise and the ability to carry forward effective solutions, that will in turn create momentum for this kind of uh, effort to increase in size and scope and, uh, and uh, offer much better efficiencies and savings for everybody. Okay, and that's a good question. I would just 
also comment when you do have a private sector running the roads, you, you end up with, it's hard to, a bit difficult to manage the uh, monopolist type opportunities, so th uh, whoever's organizing those things has to be aware of that, and so that the, uh, the way that uh, the whole business is run has to be done in a way that, of course, the private sector is compensated, but not put in a position where they basically own the entire infrastructure and uh, control pricing completely. Um, okay, so uh, once again, I'd like to thank our panelists. If anybody, I think we'll be here, most of you guys can wait here for a few minutes. If anyone has questions that they wanted to ask and didn't have the opportunity to ask them, I, I think you can certainly come up and talk to our panelists individually afterward. And uh, having said that, I'd like to invite Carol back up to the podium to uh, make a statement and close out for us. Well, thank you, uh, Dave. Uh, transportation is definitely the most difficult nut to crack from an environmental perspective. We all want the freedom to move around when and uh, where we like. And this morning, our panel uh, has made some excellent suggestions about how this can be a chain achieved uh, sustainably. I, I would like to thank all of our panels, uh, Richard Wallace, uh, Jonathan Hack, uh, Glenn Miller, and Curtis McBride, and in particular, our moderator, Dave Pascoe, for doing uh, such a great job of keeping us on track and thank you the audience uh, for coming to participate in this in this forum I, I would like to recognize our panelists and uh, and Dave um, by giving them a, a small token of our appreciation thank you, Carol. Starting in 15 minutes in this theater is the panel dis discussion, uh, a smart grid for Ontario, uh, the role for private industry. And this panel is going to explore the contributing roles that private industries will fill as a specific innovative technology needs are identified as a part of smart grid deployment. Uh, also in the amphitheater at 10.45, there's a session on exemplary and emerging models in commercialization. Uh, that's being moderated by Mario Thomas, uh, who's one of the SVPs at, uh, at OCE. Uh, so thank you, uh, all of you, for participating, and uh, we look forward to seeing you back to talk about Smart Grid. Thank you.